Talk, we talk about food, fishing, farming, and all things East End. And today, we begin our second season of Food Talk, if you can believe that. And our guest is the incredible Chef George Hirsch. Uh, George, you are one of Long Island's most celebrated chefs. As I read over your bio, I mean, you've lived two lives on Long Island, if not three. So you started the culinary program at the uh, uh, New York Institute of Technology at Westbury. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've cooked for presidents and heads of state. Uh, you have had your own show on PBS for how long now? 23 years. Wow. Uh, you've authored five books. You've appeared on the Today Show, uh, Good Morning uh, America, um, uh, Live with Kelly, uh, MSNBC, CNNBC, and now you've arrived. You're on Food Talk. Well, <laughs> Steve, let me just say, first I was going to come here and I was going to say, what? You don't call, you don't write, <laughs> but it, you invite me to your TV show. Well, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, right. I know, I know, I know, right? I know. As most good friends that I have, that's when I get to be reunited right. with okay. good old buddies. Fair enough. My so apologies. you've made it up. You've made it thank up. You. Thank you've you, made it up. Thank you. And congratulations on your anniversary. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, a real gift, and I have to thank my producer, Ellen Jane Watson, because it was her idea, and the fantastic people at LTV, the beautiful set that we have. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a lucky man. Um, let's talk about your career because you have been, you've had your, you were one of the first chefs to have your own show on News 12. Mm -hmm. um, you had a celebrated restaurant called American Bistro. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, you, you made this transition, which I, I, I think that you were happy being a, or tell me if you were happy being a, an active chef, but you, you, you end up with this gig on News 12, which really turned into your, 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 your gig on, on, on PBS. So tell, tell our viewers about that. Well, Steve, you know, media has changed quite a bit. The food world has changed quite a bit. The right. culinary arts has changed considerably. Yeah. First and foremost, I am a chef. You know, I am a, a certified chef. I am a certified educator. Uh, cooking has been my life. And whatever heartbeat or artery that has taken through my various paths in my career, um, being a chef was first and foremost. Um, That's good to know. I think if there's any advice of young cooks or aspiring chefs out there is learn the craft first. And that's what I was blessed with very, very early in my life. And I'm talking about starting at 13 and scrubbing pots and cleaning toilets and because you just weren't allowed to touch food because you had to learn the respect. You had to learn all about the ingredients. If it was a potato, you better know a thousand ways of handling that one potato. Right. So with, with all this, it was just the natural progression and, and I guess my um, inner self to aspire for excellence mm. and always trying that. Um, I can remember, you know, if, if you want to talk about early celebrity thing or whatever, I remember being in my high school and I had an opportunity uh, with sports and take that track or food and cooking. And a great, you know, it, the, school I went to was National Champs and the Gridiron and you know you train in the summer and you do this and then finally the coach said to me you got to take a choice is it going to be football or cooking I said see you later <laughs> <laughs> where'd you go to high school I went to uh, Central Islip High School right, so you're a Long Island boy I'm a Long Island boy and it was a very very tough school for oh, yeah. sports oh, no question. extremely competitive well, it turned out what well, Boomer Esiason came out of at least the Islip Township exactly <clears throat> exactly and tough divisions right but the coaches were, were excellent yeah. and, and some of what they inspired me also um, kind of laid into my track so with that I did get under uh, the uh, I guess the the, the helm of, of, of training I went to culinary classes in the evening. Mm. My father would take me all the way to Deer Park, drive for about a half hour, take the class, every kind of, every kind of baking class, every kind of uh, uh, cooking class, 
And then those instructors took me under their tutelage and I began a culinary competition for an organization. It still exists. It was Society Culinaire Philanthropique, uh -huh. which was a very prestigious culinary society, and you were not allowed to just be accepted. You know, it was these French chefs who, you know, but they even welcomed me in because I think they, they saw my passion. Mm. So with, with, with all my roots and, and um, working in different experiences, in baking, in cooking, in garmage, um, it just naturally led me through, you know, hotels, restaurants. Right. Um, Leona Helmsley, uh -huh. who, you know what, a lot of people have badmouthed her, um, and I'm sure she did some things that were not, um, you know, maybe kind or sweet. But one thing I absolutely respected about her. She expected excellence for everybody that was within her, her regime or her team. And um, if you did that, you were well compensated for right. it. So why not try and do that? So in high school then, at the age of 15, I won a gold medal from the Society Culinary Philanthropique. It probably took me 200 hours for this one presentation at the, uh, uh, then it was the New York Restaurant Hotel show. Right. And Newsday did um, a three page full color, and then all of a sudden within my high school I was a celebrity. Right. When, you know, back then you were looked at cooking, right. I, you know, right. come on. Right. So um, not that that stuck with me, but I think that gave me the, the uh, learning curve of if you work towards something and you use the practice and, you know, you're listening to your mentors, um, it, it all just then, then works in. So that's um, kind of you know the, the the first step into you know there was no such thing as a celebrity chef. R correct. Yeah, there was no such thing. Um, what's the strangest thing that's ever happened to you on TV? Because you you you've 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 had multiple years at, mm -hmm. at PBS. You've had any just weird? Now, if if you have nothing strange, it's okay. But I'm just I'm just wondering if any you had any odd. Something odd happened to you. The oddest thing, um, you know, with so many series and uh, cookbooks, and also representing a lot of very good uh, Fortune 100 companies, you you go on media tours. Right. So you, uh, when you do a media tour, you might be doing 20, 30 cities, and you think it's glamorous because you're getting put up in the best hotels, best food but you're waking up at four in the morning, which I generally do anyway, okay? And then the grind starts. You, you get into, you know, you get picked up by, an, by your escort, by your handler, then, you, I mean, you know this because, yeah. you, you know, I'm talking the handler or the handler. Morning too, by okay. Way. So um, we, uh, then you do the radio, early radio stations, early morning shows, then you do late morning interviews, then you do uh, midday shows, then you, then you keep working the clock all throughout the day, and then, bingo, you put on your four o'clock flight, you wind up in your next city, and then you start that band all over again. Okay, so I was doing this now, I'm into um, maybe, you know, the seventh, eighth day of, of doing this grind, okay. So, um, I'm blurry, I'm tired, okay. You know, you turn it on when you're on TV, but right. then you, you have to reserve your energy. You're eating a, you know, a tuna sandwich right, in the car on the way to the next thing, and you know, on and on and on. I, I'm, I check into the Four Seasons in Seattle, so I'm really excited. And I used to jog all the time, so if I checked in, I would go for a quick jog, and sometimes that'd be the only way I'd get to see some of the city. Right. And I went right through, it was at Pike's Market. Ah, I saw Rainier cherries. Ah, give me a bag, give me a bag. You know, like a pound of those Rainier cherries. I take them back to uh, my hotel room. I, I pop them in a little bit. And that's now I'm going to get ready and go to bed. I pop open my suitcase, and I go, <laughs> I didn't pack this lingerie. <laughs> and, and I don't remember packing high pumps. None of the things in my suitcase were, um, oh were my mine. God. I looked at the suitcase. <clears throat> it was identical to mine. So my driver must have picked it up. Okay, got put in the car, but it was the Four Seasons. Okay, 
and they make everything right. So they said, Mr. Hirsch, we will take care of everything. We promise you we will find your bag or, you know, they knew I was on like at 5 a.m. We will have something picked out for you to wear the next morning. And sure enough, um, probably about maybe midnight or so, it was a knock at the door. They were able to track it back to the airline to the other. And I guess she was just as, you know, right. to, to see cookbooks Jeans and such. And books, right. <laughs> was I missing a cookbook? <laughs> But then what really was terrible, when I checked out the next morning, I was so frantic to get out, I left my cherries in the room. Oh, <laughs> that's no good. That was easy. Yeah, I don't know if that was easy. But um, now, George, uh, we're not going to cook quite yet, but tell us about what you've brought today and who some of your local go-to farmers are. It is like everyone and everyone, and I'm not being PC here. No, okay. I believe it. They are the most passionate people who um, just have so much pride in everything they do. You know, farmers really are my heroes, you know, in their life. Mm -hmm. um, I come from generations back from my grandmother's family were farmers in Pennsylvania. Um, they grew everything, livestock and produce, because that's how you survived, you know, back, you know, in the uh, uh, pre-depression, post-depression era. Um, but specifically, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, pikes over here in Sagaponic, um, all the way to the North Fork. Um, many of my friends, I have very, very dear friends in the Seps family. Oh, yeah. They're very, very generous. Yeah, Every people. benefit I do, if I do something with John Bon Jovi or if I do something with um, the retreat or any type of um, benefit, they're there. And they're not coming with, okay, here's a bunch of beets and go to it. You know, they're loading up a, one of the boats from the marinas on the North Fork and shuttling it over to Sag Harbor for me to get it, to be able to process it. So they, they believe in my mission. They believe in, in my tracks um, and my love for this East End. And what did you, what did you bring for us today? Uh, today we have some uh, uh, cherry stone clams, um, which are lightly steamed, open. They're just steamed in a little bit of, of white wine, and that's it. Okay, the most important thing when we set up the dish later, and I'll show you, is the juice. Yeah. Because that's, that's the taste of our region. That's oh, the yeah. taste of our waters. That's right. So oh, you try wait. not to monkey too much with, right. with, the, uh, with the taste of the clams. Um, we're going to try to stump you. I have a hunch you may get this. I think I am, I think this is our 14th episode or thereabouts. I think I'm 13 for 13 for Stumping Chefs, okay. which is more about the Food Lover's Companion, which we use in our office all the time. Yes. But I have a hunch you may get this one. Can you tell us what Chirinabi is? Um, and then I win the <laughs> Maserati that's been parked outside <laughs> yeah, for that, 14 that weeks. correct. Okay. Chirinabi. Chirinabi. Cheer a nobby. Da, na, 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 na. Yeah. You're going to die when you hear what it is. I'm Except trying to break it down. Cheer and then nobby. You want a hint? I was going to ask is it uh, in agriculture or is it in. It's a dish that you would eat and it's Asian. Mmm. Mm. Not so. So, <laughs> uh, it is a Japanese one-pot dish with usually a fleshy fish, and then okay. vegetables are added, and it's eaten communally. So you'd go to a table, they bring over the pot, the fish is in it, the vegetables are in it. There may be other accoutrements on the table, and people add it. It cooks while you eat other things, and it's a one-pot dish. I can't believe I stumped you because so you it are is. The man. It is like a almost like a bouillabaisse that you would. Yeah. Put and bring out. You could almost. Yes, I would call it a Japanese bouillabaisse that might not be too much of a stretch. No, yeah. that, I, I, all right, good. All right. Stump George Hirsch. We learn every day. We learn every day. Um, strangest thing ever happened to you in a restaurant? You can pass on that one. Strangest thing. Hmm. Ah, okay. I, I would say... This could be in a restaurant kitchen where you work, too. This is, I, I would say this goes more in line because, you know, I love to talk about how wonderful chefs are 
and how generous chefs are. And this isn't a one-time wonder, okay? Right. This happens all the time. Right. And just not to myself as a celebrity chef, but it's kind of this bond you all have. So as a chef, when you go and dine in um, another chef's restaurant and they know you're there, it, it, it almost gets a little embarrassing. It's a beautiful thing, but it's okay. crazy. But don't the, eat for two days prior. Don't, don't. And then be careful <laughs> yeah. not to order. <laughs> because yeah, the food just keeps You begin going. to order, but then you get people at other tables yeah. beginning to look at you. I know. Like, what are you, are you a glutton? Yeah. I mean, it's like. The, Must have a tapeworm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They just keep coming and coming and coming. So um, strange, I'm not sure, but. But a wonderful experience. No, it is, and it's uh, it is unusual if you're a regular diner. You just go like, who is that? Who is that? Because I've experienced that because publicists are just one step down from uh, from chefs. So, th or I'm eating with chefs, and right. you get hooked up, and it's and you're right. Order light because the food's coming sure. in. It's a blessing. It's it's such a gift to receive that love because that's really what's coming out of the kitchen is love. Well, you know, you repping chefs, and there is probably no better way for you to be able to rep a chef you gotta eat. is to know the heartbeat of their food. Correct. So them putting these plates out for you is it, better than it's in their sitting best. down yeah, and just, yeah. oh, here's my bio. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. no. We need to eat the food, experience the flavors, and. Uh, and just know and, what's the identifiable difference. I, I, I agree. What got you into PR? I was desperate to get out from behind the bar. I was a bartender, a professional bartender, and I was doing some freelance writing, and somebody asked me, had I ever written a press release? And I said, what's that? I wrote one, I got a hit in New York Newsday, mm -hmm. and a little light bulb went off, and so I, I wanted to do that, and I was about to move out to the East End. I got offered a job by Jeff at right. Nick and Tony's, and that's how I ended up at Nick and Tony's. And I said to Jeff, I go, you should do one of these press releases. <laughs> you know? And we, our, our first client was The Honest Diner. And um, uh, I was just at the right time at the right place. And so I actually had a PR firm before I knew what PR was. So, so you've, uh, you've known what old media is oh, yeah. and new media. We, uh, we were How, just talking what, about this yesterday. What would you say would be the difference between <laughs> then and uh, Technology, without question. Technology is driving the uh, train here because when we started, there was no internet, there was mm -hmm. no email, there was snail mail, there we had computers and printers, which was a big deal. If you had a fax machine, that was a big deal. And um, um, we would uh, pass disks back and forth. Yes. I actually had a, 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 a hole cut in, in, a, in, in a window, uh, in, a, in a wall that I passed disks back and forth to Nicole. And uh, with the I, don't wanna, I don't want to age you, but was it a floppy disk? It was or? a floppy oh, disk. Oh, yeah, man. it was a floppy disk. <laughs> and, and then I had these guys come by and say, so, so there's, there's this thing called the World Wide Web. And they would, they would tell me, like, you need to have, you should have space. You, you, should, you should get a website. I go, so let me get this straight. This website's just thing <laughs> up in the air, and so people are going to go to it. And it's free. I mean, it costs me to make it, but it's free for people to go. I go, okay, okay. Then another one was, um, remember, there were mobile phones that were kind of big. And, um, you said the original one came in a box, right. like you were so, landing on the moon. So we were reading some newsletter, and uh, <clears throat> the newsletter was forecasting the future. And this is also when digital cameras were hot. Mm -hmm. And so the newsletter said that um, there will come a time when your mobile phone will have a camera on it. And I, and I turned to Nicole, I go, well, that's stupid. Why <laughs> would you do that? You know? And of course, now, you know, you just, you create, you know, you, you, the, the, the camera is, you know, excellent amount of excellent pixel, pixels, and that's yeah. what spawned Instagram. And, you know, this is, this, we were into social media early on, thanks be to God, that yeah. really helped us. But uh, uh, it's ever changing. And, uh, yeah, it's, and, and you've seen it too, because you, you've had to adapt as well. You've got a vibrant Facebook page, a vibrant Instagram account. And, uh, but tell me this, sir. Yes. You've been around for a while, you've known a lot of people, but mm -hmm. more, for you, if you, because you like to cook, so tell me this, five people in the history of the world mm -hmm. that you would cook for, who, who would be at your dinner party? Mm -hmm. Well, you've been at some of my parties and uh, yeah. dinner Legendary. parties. Um, first and foremost, I think if I had the opportunity and the power to do that, I'd want my nana and my grandparents and my parents. Yep. Yeah. That would be number one. Yeah miss them deeply. They've instilled everything that they had into me. 
um, and I'm proud of that. So I'd like to have that opportunity one more time. I'll give you a so I'll give you a second five because so, I ended up doing the same thing. I had yeah. chosen these five things. Yep. I go, actually, I want my dad. I want my grandmother. I want yeah. my Aunt Julia. Yeah. I want my son. And yeah. I want Jesus. You know, I threw Jesus in there because good luck. You know. But well, uh, I did see a clip, <laughs> Mark Smith. <laughs> well, Smitty has because you uh, the, the he producer had, sent me a clip and wanted me to see the show. Right. And of course, I went to Mark and Joey, good right. friends. Right. And I go. No, he, he had, I said he picked, he picked, he picked Jesus, number right, one. Right, I would have picked Jesus, right. Gandhi, whatever. But I think, uh, regardless, I, you know, I've had celebrities and I've <laughs> had all kinds of mixes at different dinner parties and everything. And I think the key is, no matter who I would pick, persona-wise, it would be a mix. You would know, you have Leona I, Helmsley? I would You'd have, have Leona Helmsley, You know you? what? I would. <laughs> I would. And then you know who I'd have? I'd have, like, the mechanic. Or a plumber. You need that mix at a dinner Certainly party. Certainly for a Leona, right. You know, right, right, I right. mean, sometimes, you know, if, if, you know, for a dinner party, you, uh, you wouldn't invite all chefs. That right. would be, like, so right. boring. You know, first off, you get more than, you get two chefs in a room, you become a cook. <laughs> no one's a chef anymore. Right, that's correct, right. Okay. Right. And I believe you were at one of my parties, too, where we had a, a great birthday party for one of Long Island's greats, Tom Shadell. Yep. Right, Tommy, it was his 50th birthday. And I think we had 50 yeah. chefs and yeah. vintners, and, and it, it was a hoot. But it, it was too much similarity. There. Yeah. You know, you, right. you need to, uh, variety makes spice. I think spice. you used to have really good hot dogs and hamburgers, and that was yeah, the way exactly. to go. You know, yeah. some chocolate chip cookies. And really good champagne. Um, we got about five minutes left. Let's switch sure. seats yeah, and uh, show us what you've Like a bus done. holiday. Here. Yeah. Okay, so the clamps here have, like I said before, have been gently steamed just until they open. Mm. This dish is uh, Portuguese clams, can be served hot, chilled, so you can take it to almost any season. Mm. It could work for, um, you know, a cold, snowy night or a, uh, uh, you know, a tepid, humid summer's day. Um, and of course, the nicest part about this is that. Um, it's Long Island's best. Right. You know, it's clams. George, I mean, it what's, this, what's this? Uh, is this parsley? Or? This is just flat leaf parsley. Yeah, okay. And it is because of the, the seasons. Try and stick with, you know, the seasons. You know, farms aren't putting out too much right now. But, you know, um, we do have greenhouse and some, you know, microgreens that are, are able to be, you know, accessed this time of the year, as well as, you know, smoked sausage. Mm. You know, and some you know red peppers for flavor and onion, with you know a little bit of, of of garlic in there. But pretty much that's just like an accent. You know, the trick really is in the clams and the and the juice itself. I'll just use Mother Nature's most natural dish. Mm. You know, uh, probably one of the things I see in most restaurants of people of not doing something properly, is they go and they order, let's say, mussels. And, you know, they break into the shell, okay? And they use a fork and they pick, they pick the meat off the shell. You know, it's like Mother Nature gave you the best tool, the best china, the best equipment right here. <laughs> Get that and slurp it up. Yep, yep. All right? And then, of course, by all means, is, you know, have some great bread to serve along with it. Do you need to turn the oven on? No, we're going to serve this cool. Oh, nice. We're going to oh, serve cool. this room temperature, just as a different style. Rico. So we'll put some of the previous smoked sausage, which was, you know, lightly browned. Right. A little bit of the red pepper and some caramelized garlic. Mm -hmm. You can see the caramelized garlic in there. So we'll put a little of that on. A little bit of a sweet onion, and I only use sweet onion rather than a regular Spanish onion. I don't like the bitterness from it. And we'll just is it a Vidalia onion or is it just called a sweet onion? It's any type of sweet onions. Throughout the uh, throughout the year, you'll have onions that um, that change. Like Vidalias would be from Georgia, so they'd be probably harvest in uh, from March through like June. Okay. But then it changes. Well, Walla Walla or you know, North Fork onions. Right, you know, that right, are growing. right. You know, some nice sweet onions. And then just give it a little toss. 
Think of it almost like a vinaigrette. And then we can uh, plate it up very simply right on the bread because you want the bread to also get some of the, some of the juice. Yep. And it's something that's very easy to make. It's probably one of Long Island's treasures yep. that is still so abundant, not facing any kind of restrictions or yep. extinctions or, you know, it's fully, fully sustainable. You know, just a drop of lemon on top. Mm. And entertaining and putting things together is just about making it not really a sweat. You know, just, I find that no matter how many dinner parties I do or any kind of entertaining, even, um, you know, cooking for benefits, people like to get involved. Yeah. So no matter how big your area is, everybody always gathers around. The kitchen. The kitchen. I'm a kitchen the man. The island. Yeah, yeah, I'm a kitchen man. Uh, my second cookbook was actually called Gather Around the Grill oh. because when you light the grill, even if people are in the backyard and they're drinking beers over here or chatting it up over there, you light the grill, it's kind of like this, not right. a living dead thing. <laughs> that everybody, everybody just kind of walks towards, you know. Oh, this looks beautiful. Um, we'll have a bite. Now, George, we've got a couple minutes left. Sure. Uh, we've got a minute left, actually. Tell us about, tell the viewers about your project at Cormaria, because this is fascinating to me. Cormaria is actually something that touched my heart. Um, they had a chef walk out on them, although I don't want to call him a chef because no chef would ever do that, in the middle of a retreat with 70 guys, and I got a call from the bishop, can you help them out? Can you help Sister Anne out? I said, absolutely, and um, I went, I met with her, we talked for several hours on what Cormaria has done for years, uh, what they do for the community, what they do for the region, how people come there from all over the world in that special place. So my assurance to Sister Anne was she'll never be without a chef again. And whatever I can do to help sustain them food-wise in their menus, in their facility, which has just gone through a year and a half of major renovation and opens up tomorrow in Sac Harbor. So go online, check out Cor Maria, what they're on 18 uh, acres. On 18 beautiful acres, um, it is uh, open to the public for retreats, and they do have certain retreats that you are invited. And I also do certain events to help them out, such as Sunday suppers, which are community. Right. And out here, you know, is always the big ticket, and I do a big ticket event for them too right. in, every Good. year. Good. But um, the Sunday suppers is a way for community to come together and be about Sunday eating food and enjoying That's conversation. Open to the public. And that's open to the public, very minimum, for yeah, right. only a few dollars. Last question. Where are you going to go for East End Restaurant Week, March 26th to April 2nd? Um, that list you gave me when I came down, I'm going to start at number one and work my way got through. Some great restaurants. You, we're going, to, we're going to write a check to Maureen's Haven, too, so it's a good thing to do. Give them back to the East End because the East End is a fabulous place. Oh, I get best. goosebumps every time I, I know. I'm I so talk glad you're it. out here, George. Me, too. Thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. All right. Beautiful.